So I'm trying to do something. I quit my cushy job at Facebook about a year and a half ago to basically put the functionality of this multi-million dollar machine into a wearable. Seems impossible, huh? Well, that's why it was interesting. 18 months ago, I was running advanced development at Oculus and Facebook, and actually developed um, a literally glasses version of toggable AR VR with 180 degree field of view and foveal resolution and perfect eye tracking and all of that. But as I was doing it, it occurred to me, you know, we're hitting a discontinuity in Moore's law because in my vaunted position at Facebook and the, the previous position I had in a similar role at Google and my colleagues at Microsoft and Apple and Sony, we had pushed for manufacturing process improvements in this, the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure that makes liquid crystal displays and camera chips in order for us to make pixels that are approximately the size of the wavelength of light. And what that means is you can modulate the waves in the wavelength of light. You can record not just the intensity of light, but the interference of light. Holography, if you will. Not holography like a rock, dead rock star appearing on stage in Las Vegas, but holography, the thing that won the Nobel Prize in 1971, an information encoding system that allows us to see all of the light that passes through or transmits through or reflects off of an object all at once from every angle. So what I use is near-infrared light, and there's an imaging modality that's commonly used in, med in medical imaging. How that actually works is imagine that gray block is off my arm or something, and here's a whole bunch of rays of light. They're all the same color, near-infrared, but I'm color coding them to explain to you really what scattering is. And as they bounce through this object, one of the rays, the orange ray, isn't going faster, they're all going, it's light, it's all going at the speed of light. Um, it's just one of them doesn't get ricocheted around so much. And so that's really how FNIRs and near-infrared imaging mostly work. But if you want to get a CRISPR image, you use a detector that can distinguish at the speed of light, picosecond detector, detectors, which can distinguish the speed of light to a third of a millimeter. I saw that and I saw a system about five years ago that approached the resolution of MRI using near-infrared light. So a two-ton magnet, a multi-million dollar system in a, in a hospital that is uncomfortable to lie in. And I thought, whoa, we can lower the cost of that by a thousand-fold, leveraging the manufacturing infrastructure of Asia and holography. And by holography, I mean this, capturing the, all of the light that reflected off of an object all at once for every angle. Focus it all down to, to a voxel, to a certain area. And then we can raster scan the body and use a slow speed detector, like the detectors Detector, another word for detector is camera chip. Every single one of you in your smartphone today has one micron pixels. That's the wavelength of near-infrared light. That's what you need to be able to record the interference pattern of near-infrared light. So this is a huge deal because what I'm talking about is replacing a room size, the most expensive room in the hospital with LCDs and camera chips and lasers that can be manufactured in the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure of Asia that currently makes the components in your smartphones. So something that can be put into that size and shape. Now we're designing new components, a new camera chip, new liquid crystal displays, new kinds of lasers. Not designed for the human visual system as pretty much all camera chips are and for images and not, but instead designed to record interference and scattering and so forth. So to get that to happen, you want the pixel size to be approximately the wavelength of light. And so you need to do that in the camera chips and the LCD displays, but you don't really care about bit depth, you don't care about a lot of different things that we do. And so we've really redesigned um, the architectures of, it's hard to even call them camera chips and LCDs anymore, but, we want the speed. So we totally reinvent the architecture. So here's basically the, the basic components of a wearable where we're tiling something that's got a liquid crystal display, a waveguide, and, uh, and um, a sandwich, detectors, and another chip um, with a lining that's connected with uh, fiber optic. 
And this goes on the inside of a ski hat or a bandage or, or a bra or really anything where you want to detect what's going on in your body. This is well-established physics from over 50 years ago by the pioneers of holography that did the work that won Dennis Gabor the Nobel Prize for the idea. That's what being able to capture phase and intensity allows you to do. See through fog, see through the body, see through all these things. Been known for a really long time, but only now with the trickle down of Moore's law and the economic push for next generation high fidelity in VR, is it accessible to reach? Our first product to do a brain computer interface by the way, um, if I throw you into an MRI machine for an hour, I can tell you if you've got a tumor or something. If I throw you in for 10 to 100 hours, I can tell you what words you're about to say, what images are in your head, whether you're in love or not, what music you're thinking of, and on and on and on, by just looking at the use of oxygen voxel by voxel in your head, which this is enabling. So yes, I'm talking about communicating telepathically using this system. It's this custom architecture where we're really getting the signal to noise ratio that matters for seeing um, blood flow, for seeing oxygen use, and for um, basically making a hologram, which is really described we only need two to three bits on a hologram. We just need very small pixels of the differential scattering that happens that precedes an electrical pulse going down the axon of a neuron because of the way the ion channels work and the flow, that membrane roughens. And since we've neutralized the scattering of the brain or the body, we can see the differential scattering of the neuron. And we can also think we saw this fantastic talk from Ed Boyden today, optogenetics pioneer in so many other areas. Um, certainly this would be helpful to be able to deliver light non-invasively uh, through the skull and into the body as opposed to the invasive solutions being used. As I mentioned, I may be uniquely in this area, have had non-optional brain surgery. And the hardest thing I ever did in my entire life, and I just don't see elective brain surgery catching on in vast numbers. If you're going to die, fine. But otherwise, non-invasive, I think, is going to be bigger. We've got a new camera chip design with one micron pixels, um, a 10 microsecond frame time, and a high volume CMOS process really by completely rethinking the architecture of this chip. And I'd love to show you more. We're still filing patents on it. We've also totally rethought the design of um, liquid crystal displays to en enable one micron pixels, and then um, little tiny lasers that we can pulse, and so forth. So really just using the consumer electronics manufacturing infrastructure to make components that haven't existed to allow us to see deep inside of our body. And so as fantastic as this seems, it uses the tools of our time, like big data, machine learning, so forth, for, for um, the brain-computer interface, but also for looking um, radiologically inside of ourselves. We need to democratize these tools. Understanding and taking a hologram of the scattering so that we can focus voxel by voxel across any kind of scattering media, our body, what have you. And with that, we can see and even export our thoughts, which is a really big deal. If you think of, of the two billion people that suffer with brain disease, one billion of whom can't work, they may not present with the symptoms if they get even a yearly MRI scan to figure out what's wrong. And so we could imagine having a much deeper understanding of brain disease and potential cure. This also I haven't even touched on photodynamic therapy, which is by, by focusing light into your brain, you don't need to actually cut open the skull and put a probe down to do deep brain stimulation or turn off anxiety or many, many things that are being done right now. Invasively, we can open up non-invasively. Um, a bunch of graduate students as subjects and made them lay in MRI scanners for hundreds of hours watching YouTube videos while a recording of their brain reacting to the YouTube videos was made, the, the fMRI recordings. And then a machine lear learning algorithm was put on it and a new data sequence was shown called presented clip. And just from um, the MRI scans alone, the computer guessed what it thought the graduate students were looking at. And the result, and this is like six years old, it's a grainy image of what 
the students were looking at. And I saw that and I thought, wow. And if you couple that with when you see an image versus imagining seeing an image, the same areas light up in your head. So I thought, whoa, how do we up the resolution and lower the size? Because this is amazing. Like right now, we have all of this great input through our eyes and ears, but you know, the output from my brain, and hopefully the brain processing is pretty good, um, the output is basically moving our mouths or typing our fingers, maybe drawing, maybe dancing. But what if you could export images or music or the whole thought or the whole range of ideas? What would we be capable of? There's all kinds of ethical and legal issues. They're profound, which is a bit why, it's actually not even a bit. It's the main reason why I'm talking about this as it's nascent. Right now I'm telling you this and you're thinking, okay, the physics is solid, but yeah, right. There's something I don't get here. So we're gonna show a live system this year. I'm not exactly sure where or I'd tell you, but we're gonna show it on stage at a conference. It's, it's really works, it's solid. And uh, um, then you'll start to take the ethics discussions a little more seriously, because it's pretty important. So, I mean, but the flip side is if we say we don't want to do it, is it that we don't want to know how our minds work? Uh, the National Academies of most every developed world have said of the top five things you can do as a technologist, reverse engineering the brain is somewhere on that list in the top five. And we could say we don't know, want to know how our brains work. We could say that we don't care about the two billion people with brain disease, with the drugs that haven't really changed substantially. In, in decades, or massively lowering the cost of healthcare diagnostics and radiology. But I don't think we're going to say that. I think we're going to just put some rules in place. We can detect tumors, clogged arteries, and your thoughts. And we can even deliver light to a neuron or molecularly. So in the limit, you could imagine maybe you could replace drugs. In photodynamic therapy right now, where even by cutting open and delivering light, there's this cliche, light, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Well, it's actually true that it kills pneumonia if you can deliver it into your lung, or actually some interesting sort of hybrid work is being done at MGH right now, where they can use 10% of a chemo dose if they also deliver light therapy. So these hybrid approaches are pretty exciting too. So um, with that, this is what we're doing. I've told you why <laughs> it's possible and stay tuned. We'll, we'll show a demo this year.